Well, good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to this, uh, this keynote address for the British Scholar Conference uh, 2012. Uh, it's a great honour for me to introduce the um, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of this great university, uh, Professor Sir Tim O'Shea, on my left. Um, it's a particularly, uh, particularly delighted and, and pleased because uh, we are in the middle, or at the very beginning, or certainly uh, in place is the annual graduation ceremonials in this university. Uh, and I know that um, his desk is very busy most of the time, but it's particularly busy at the moment. And he has actually to leave at 7.30 to go up to Pollock Halls to host um, an honorary graduates uh, dinner, dinner tonight. Uh, so we're delighted that he and Lady O'Shea, who's sitting in the front, the front seat here, have made time to come here. So without more ado, can you welcome, please, uh, Professor Sir Tim O'Shea, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tom. And it's a, tr a tremendous pleasure um, to welcome you to this special lecture in uh, what is a very special co conference, the Britain and the World Conference. Very appreciative of the two sponsors, the, the British Scholar Society, based, as you would obviously expect, in Austin, Texas, uh, which I'm hook em horns, the eyes of Texas. I'm completely, there they are, completely having spent uh, very happy times in Austin, Texas. Very delighted about that. And, and obviously, uh, the Scottish Centre for Diaspora Studies, headed by uh, Scotland's most distinguished historian, Professor Devine, who just introduced me. Um, you've got, uh, for your keynote tonight, a really appropriate speaker. Uh, Mike Russell studied theology, then Scottish history and literature at this university. Um, he's uh, worked as a television producer and a director. He's an author of seven books. He's very much <coughs> involved in the cultural uh, and political life of Scotland in a whole variety of ways. Uh, not only is he fluent in Gaelic, but he's the first person uh, to have addressed the European Council in that language. Um, he was the chief executive of the Scottish uh, National Party uh, for five years, from 1994. He's now holding his uh, third ministerial post, uh, steadily holding more important positions um, in the government. He's currently the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, um, so he's my boss, uh, <laughs> yeah, and he, so the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning has a very demanding brief, includes all the schools, all the colleges, and, and all the universities. Um, he is amazingly effective at that. Um, he has a real passion for education um, through his advocacy um, in the Scottish Government. Um, the universities are in a very strong position. As you walk, go around this university, you will notice uh, it is booming, it has wonderful buildings, it is littered with fine scholars such as Professor Devine. Uh, some of these uh, wonderful successes wouldn't be happening without uh, Mike's advocacy. So <clears throat> as far as the talk goes, he's learned, he's eloquent, uh, he's passionate for Scotland, and like you, I'm really fascinated to learn about Scotland transformed cricket, passports, and the resilience of the social union. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Mike Russell. Tim and Tom, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think uh, I speak on behalf of all my colleagues in the Scottish Government and say that you do us a great honour by meeting here uh, this week. So I want to welcome you all to Edinburgh to express our gratitude that you've chosen to meet here and I do hope the many experiences you've had will be both uh, stimulating and pleasurable at the same time. And you are in Scotland at an interesting time. Last night, many of you would have attended a, a panel session which considered some of the key constitutional issues which will be put to the people of Scotland in a referendum on independence in the uh, autumn of 2014. Now, from that, you may have gleaned that historical studies are, as ever, and particularly in Scotland, um, rather controversial. There are some people in Scotland who believe that teaching Scottish history or Scottish literature, as I shall illustrate later, is tantamount to preaching sedition. And you may now also realise that the disputations and passions about our future 
which can be heard every day and in every form of media, actually often mask the fact that in mainstream Scottish politics, much unites the, plain, the main players. This is a place of contrasts and contention, but it's also a place of ideas and imagination. As Education Secretary, I'm very proud of the fact that Scotland is one of the top-ranking nations in the world in terms of the excellence of its higher education. Indeed, no other small country in the world, no other small country of the world of our size has five universities in the world's top 200, including this one, my own alma mater. Contrasts, contention, ideas, and imagination, I hope, are going to abound tonight. And they certainly abound in the very distinguished scholar who invited me to undertake this task, my friend, Professor Tom Devine. I have no hesitation in uh, uh, repeating what Tim said. He is our foremost historian. He's also one of our most valued public intellectuals, and he demands the highest standards from his elected representatives, uh, and indeed he is one of my constituents, so I know that, just as he always demanded the highest standards of his students. Now tonight I want to talk about the Scotland I live in today, and I want to do so by unfolding two narratives and touching on a third. The first is an unashamedly personal story, one of the 5,254,800 they're all around us in this country, and that's the latest Registrar General's estimate of the Scottish population. The second is a counterpoint to that story. It's the political tale of changes that have taken place in Scottish politics and in Scottish life during the last 40 years, or what they might imply for the future. And in telling those two stories, I hope at least to touch upon the teaching and understanding of Scottish history in our schools and universities. And I want to weave those strands together because, for me, they're interrelated. I hope they will give you some insights into this country that I call home. Let me start 121 years ago and well outside Scotland's borders. On the 23rd of April 1891, St George's Day of course, as well as a date believed to be Shakespeare's birthday, my maternal grandfather was born in the village of Abbots Langley, which lies to the north of London. It was the village in which the only English Pope, Nicholas Breakspear, later Adrian IV, was born almost 800 years earlier. In March 1920, my mother was born there too. Her mother, one Jessie Adair, having met my grandfather when she worked as a domestic servant in the local asylum. However, her father was Scottish and had joined the British Army in Kilwinning in the early 1860s. And Jessie's brothers were born in Malta and Gibraltar during military postings. She entered the world at Woolwich, near the Arsenal. Now, at some time and place between Kilwinning and Woolwich, Jess's father had married a girl from Norfolk, whose own father is listed in the 1851 census as living in a Barmer Lane in the village of Docking, where he'd been born in 1816 and where he was working as a shepherd. That complex little cameo confirms that I'm well described as being what of what the contemporary Scottish novelist William McIlvenny called our mongrel nation, and proudly so. It clearly indicates that in Scotland, involvement in the national movement and in national politics is about a belief in self-determination and, as I hope to show during the evening, social and economic progress rather than any matter of breeding or blood. And then most of all, it makes me very much a product of what is called the social union, that intermixing of marriage, sex and mobility which has peopled all the parts of these islands. More prosaically, on my father's side, I can find my way back to Stevenson's, Hunter's, Montgomery's and Russell's across the Scottish county of Ayrshire, and into Galloway, where I can, apparently, Episcopalian as I am, stand distant heir to Margaret Wilson, one of the covenanting Solway martyrs, imaginatively painted by Millet. And there will also be, uh, and is, a smattering of Irish, some English, some Norse, probably a little Norman, uh, in the fact that Russell derives from the old French for red face or beard. But let me return briefly to the English home counties. My maternal grandfather came to Scotland in the early 1930s to work for and then own a publishing and printing business which once published in Enid Blyton. He died in Edinburgh in the mid-1960s, a man whose proudest boast was that he once bowled out W.G. Grace at cricket, though the chronology would mean that Grace would have been very well past his best. Cricket is a, support, a sport commonly associated only with England and the Commonwealth. And it's an interesting side issue in the whole debate about Scotland, England and Britain. The Tory politician Norman Tebbett once memorably talked of the cricket test, 
which was meant to provide a modern equivalent of the ducking stool to pr prove allegiance. Yet we should be cautious at describing cricket in any way that equates it solely with one part of these islands. There is a first-class cricket ground in Wales. Scotland has played in the World Championship. And most interestingly of all, it is alleged that there are more Scottish village cricket teams per head of population here than there are in England. Indeed, there have been many famous and infamous Scottish cricketers, some of whom have even played for England. The most celebrated would have to be the former England captain, Mike Derness, perhaps also the 1931 Cricketer of the Year, alongside Donald Bradman, the spinner Ian Peebles. And if you know anything about cricket at all, the most reviled player would have been a Scot, Douglas Jardin, at the heart of the body line controversy. So cricket does not divide Scotland and England. Sometimes it unites it for good and for ill. But for my grandfather, cricket was England. And it surprises even me to realize that he died less than half a century ago. So much do his views appear of an entirely different time. Yet the year he died, 1966, was the year before Winnie Ewing, certainly the most famous female Scottish politician of her time, won a celebrated by-election at Hamilton for the Scottish National Party, starting the party's continuous parliamentary representation and launching what I think is now accepted as the, a, a distinctive Scottish politics in the modern era. My lecture tonight is entitled Cricket, Passports and the Resilience of the Social Union. So let me at the outset also bring in and get rid of the issue of passports. My father was from an upper working class background. His father had been a, a motor mechanic and chauffeur for one of the big houses in the small town of Troon in Ayrshire, who had managed to start his own small garage business. He had started a college course in Glasgow in 1938, but had left it in the summer of 1939 to volunteer for the Argyll and Southern Highlanders, then recruiting at the barracks of Newton on Air. On his first night in the barrack room with one of his friends who had joined up with him, they were the only two who were not speaking Gaelic when life lights went out. And why one of life's little coincidences, the company they were assigned to, was that raised in the small Argyll community of Glenderool, where I came to live quite unknowingly some 54 years later. His wartime career led him from the beaches of Dunkirk, where he was badly wounded, through mountain training in Vereri, to intelligence work in Egypt and the learning of Arabic. That got him a job as a writer's correspondent post-war and then a position in the British Consular Service posted to Lebanon, Libya, and Iraq. And it was in a Mosul in Iraq that he met a young girl from Edinburgh with a sense of adventure who was teaching physical education to Iraqi children and who needed her passport renewed. That was my mother, and they married less than a year later. Several careers after that, they were back in Ayrshire in Troon, with my father finally qualified as a teacher, myself and two brothers attending the school he had attended 30 years before, Mar College. So it would be as a 14-year-old, third-year pupil at that school that I might have remembered that night in November 1967, when Winnie Ewing achieved a 38% swing to take Hamilton from Labour. And I would have been 17 when the SNP won the Western Isles in 1970, the very last seat to declare, and continued SNP parliamentary representation at a moment when it looked as if the SNP had once again gone from hero to zero in the space of a few years. But though I, I think I have some recollection of the events, if I had any political focus then, it would be on Labour, a party I joined when I went to Edinburgh University that same year, and uh, under who the president of the Labour Club, one Gordon, one Gordon Brown, I wonder what happened to him, uh, served in that for a number of years. Winnie Ewing's victory is worth pausing on. It was not the first ever SNP parliamentary victory. That was in Motherwell in 1945, when Robert McIntyre became an MP for only a few months. But there were similarities in that victory, what happened in Hamilton, what happened in the Western Isles. In Motherwell, there hadn't been an election for 10 years. And all the parties, save the SNP, had agreed on an electoral choose during wartime, including the communists. In Hamilton, the election was caused by the elevation, by his own party, of a fairly ordinary MP to a profitable sinecure. And in the Western Isles, the sitting member had been there for 35 years, but spent more time in Corfu than Kalanish, he being a keen supporter of Greek democracy. In these circumstances, the SNP inspired confidence and interest. They were the antithesis of machine politicians. They had enthusiastic, hard-working, and hungry teams, very unlike the mainstream parties who were jaded by years of electoral success. And in addition, the clarity and compelling nature of the simple political message, it's time for change, should never be underrated. 
nor should the attraction of a campaign that promises to give more control to the individual voter than le add less to the political system. And finally, voters often like the opportunity, particularly at by-elections, to make decisions which go against conventional wisdom. All of those factors underpin the rise of the SNP in electoral terms before 1974, and perhaps even during that year which became an Ananas Mirabilis. But they do not adequately explain the way in which that rise was triggered, nor why it continued. To look at why it was triggered, we have to look a little further back and understand a current running in Scottish politics from almost the time of the Act of Union itself, a current of dissatisfaction about the effects of that constitutional settlement and a hankering for something better. The campaign to re-establish the Office of Secretary of State for Scotland, a campaign which grew in the middle of the 19th century, succeeded in part in 1885 and in full in 1892 when the post became a cabinet one, was the political, politically visible sign of a growing view that administrative devolution of power was a desirable and then a mainstream objective in Scottish politics. But the outrider of that campaign was a more fundamental objection to the centralization of Scottish governance in London and the demand for an equivalent status in, of countries such as Canada and Australia, dominion status, as it was known. Somewhere between those positions was what we know as home rule, which was as difficult to define as Devo Max is now. In its political incarnation, it meant more than simple administration, but less than government. But it's in its literary and artistic incarnations it's much better known in the 19th and early 20th century. And this took the form of a, an unfocused desire for change, allied for a search of Scottishness, a sense of Scottishness actual as well as imagined, which would allow the recreation of a past authority planted in and nurtured by cultural soil. And that process necessitated, in part at least, the rediscovery of Scottish history. Not that such history was ever lost. The political campaign to re-establish even minor administrative devolution had created a momentum that led, for example, to the founding of the Sir William Fraser Chair of Scottish History and Paleography in this university in 1901, making Edinburgh the first modern home of Scottish historical studies. And well before that, the broad brush of Sir Walter Scott made the connection between who we had been and who we should be, although the line was far from straight, and the political implications of one were never carried over into the other. The Scottish past is a fit subject for fiction, the visual arts, drama, and even music. Summerfield's uh, Highland Piano Concerto has probably concluded the genre in the 1920s, but there are many, many examples. It did not extend to it being a fit subject for the classrooms of Scotland, except by dint of personal enthusiasm of teachers. That conflict between personal enthusiasm and the view of education and broader society is wonderfully captured in a novel by the prolific but still undervalued Scottish novelist Robin Jenkins. Written at some time during the 1960s, Jenkins always allowed his novels to ripen before submitting them for publication. Fergus Lamont covers a longish period in the 20th century but starts in the 1930s. Early on in the work, one of the key protagonists, John Calderwood, is teaching about individual suffering during the Highland Clearances with a child placed at the door of the class in case the head teacher, Mr. Maybowl, comes in. And of course he does, and he remonstrates with Calderwood saying, I must warn you, you are filling these children's minds with poison. You're undermining their confidence in legally constituted authority. It is a mistake to study the history of one's own country. It divides us instead of uniting us. Why bother with stuff so out of date? But there is, however, an immediate and perfect riposte. A child from the slums of the town in which the novel is set, the fictional Gantuck, speaks up and says, it isn't out of date, Mr. Maybowl. People are still being put out of their houses. People are still suffering at that time, and the reality is that they're still suffering. Now, I certainly only started to discover Scottish history in my final year at school when I undertook the old Certificate of Six-Year Studies, a, a precursor for the advanced hire. And I chose a local history project and moved from that into an interest in Scottish ecclesiastical history which I followed up in my first two years as a theological student before finishing my studies here with a specialism in Scottish history and literature. And that was comparatively unusual in the early 1970s when European and British history would have been much more common choices even at this university. Even today, there are more chairs in other historical studies in Scotland than there are in Scottish history, though the situation has improved greatly in the last two generations. Edinburgh's foundation in 1901 was not followed quickly, but it has been followed. 
Glasgow now has the largest Scottish history teaching and research unit in the country. Aberdeen has a fine multidisciplinary degree programme which draws in elements of Celtic, Gaelic, English and Scottish history as well as the Research Institute of Irish and Scottish Studies. Well, back here, the fine Sc Scottish School for Diaspora Studies was created with what I think is still the largest single donation made to a history school in these islands. And my old friend and co-author, Dennis MacLeod, supported the Chair of Highland History at the University of the Highlands and Islands with a generous donation. Now, these opportunities at higher level have helped to build and develop a wider approach in schools too. The individual enthusiasms, those, for example, which led to our First Minister knowing of Blind Harry and his stories when still at primary school, have been enhanced by a growing context in which a national priority is slowly being given to knowing about Scotland as a means of opening a window on the whole world. It's not now, I think, unlikely that any child will not have at least had an opportunity to discover their own country's past while at school. This is not an imposition, but an entitlement. It fits well within our national view of the need for a broad general education. And for those who move on to qualifications in history, there are units in Scottish, British, European and world history. This is not an insular approach. But we can always do better. In higher education, we do provide a range of research in Scottish studies, but we need to encourage more and make more interdisciplinary links. And in schools, the wider context of Scottish studies now being taken forward from the recommendations of the working group set up after the last election will strengthen the place of learning about Scotland across the curriculum and enable pathways to higher levels of study. The inclusion of Scottish texts in national qualifications in English and the development of an award in Scottish studies are important contributions to enhancing the place of Scotland's languages, heritage and culture in learning. And not just for us, many of you represent the learning about Scotland from other places. Just last week I met with a group from McGill University in Toronto who now wish to establish a chair of Scottish studies there too. Many exist. And we need such study to take place, such opportunities at home and abroad, in order for us to understand our own country and relate it to the wider world. We also need them because we should encourage others to reflect to us what we don't know and what we need to be aware of. And we need it in order to join up our understanding of all the aspects of Scottish culture and heritage, in order to create a stronger foundation for our future individual and collective growth. Now, I freely admit that my own sense of who I was and the richness of my mongrel background, which developed as I studied Scottish history and literature, had a political effect. But not in the sense taken by those who discourage and still discourage the study of Scottish history for fear it would have electoral implications. A position, I have to say, most ludicrously espoused by one of the contenders for the Scottish Labour leadership last year, Ken McIntosh, who uh, described the development of new opportunities to read Scottish text and learn about Scottish past as just the SNP trying to brainwash children to their political view. In fact, I continued in Labour Party membership right through the 1974 February election, although I did vote SNP during it. And in, when I did so, I was making a conscious political choice about the type of Scotland I wish to see. And in that, I think I was being very true to my father's anti-establishment prejudices, as well as to my mother's essentially decent liberal view of what people should be encouraged and helped to achieve. What I was looking for is to put it as simply as Jenkins did in Fergus Lamont, it was a society in which poverty and all its humiliations had been abolished without refinement and spirituality being sacrificed. Or to put it another way, and to quote Jenkins again, it was the start of my journey to find an answer to the question he posed in his later historical novel, Lady Magdalene, where he asked, surely ordinary people must one day get their reward in a Scotland where honour and justice prevails. Now those were the issues that propelled me to support the SNP in February 1974, which have propelled me to support it ever since, and which go on sustaining me as we move towards the referendum. In other words, the political imperative for me, for a better world, is set within an achievable Scottish context. The context of a small nation state working with other nation states in order to benefit its citizens and the wider world. Now I would accept the criticism that in expressing the issue like that, I'm giving it a clearer distillation than that was offered by the SNP, for example, in 1974, where the slogan, It's Scotland's Oil, clouded the broader issue of what you did with that oil or more accurately, what the, the national wealth that it generated. 
But I think one of the key elements in the national debate in Scotland has been that of clarification of the national goal over several political generations, and that clarification continues. Now, the two elections of 1974 were watershed moments. They were not only record political successes, they saw a party and a nation in transition. There were common elements between those elections and previous by-elections. There was the novel political approach. There was the committed political workforce. There was a sharp and attractive message of empowerment uh, and a message of change delivered amidst chaos south of the border. But there was also something else, the beginning of an ideological positioning on the left of center Scottish mainstream. Now that had been brought about at part at least by a change of political leadership. Billy Wolf, who became the SNP leader in 1969, recognized that the votes of Scotland were going and would continue to go to candidates who took a social democratic stance as he did. It was important, therefore, to mold a party which sought to create a social democratic society. Whatever home rule or self-government or independence, a word that took some time to work its way to the top of the SNP lexicon, actually meant in terms of power structures. Taking that position, putting politics into what was actually a movement for constitutional change and cultural self-expression was not an easy thing to do. The party paid a price for that in 1979 and right up to the end of the 1980s. But the generation from, that emerged from it were placing the party very firmly in a clear ideological position within the Scottish spectrum. For despite the fact that the only party in the 20th century to have won both a majority of Scottish votes and seats at a general election had been the Conservative and Unionists, and that was a key juxtaposition, Labour's dominance of Scottish politics was almost complete by the 1980s. So the SNP's up-and-coming political leadership uh, would have to start to focus on ways in which that uh, seemingly unassailable hegemony could be broken. Perhaps at that time it was thought by what was called a realignment of the left. Labour had been a party with a strong home rule tradition, but that had been progressively abandoned in the 20s and 30s. Keir Hardy had an original platform of social justice, equality, temperance and self-governance, but that had been repackaged. The self-government element had been left out. Temperance never actually recurred. Labour's conversion to and mishandling of the 1970s devolution issue is well recorded, but by the late 1980s, the contrast between its electoral dominance in Scotland and its inability to win at Westminster became the issue. There were a number of spectacular SNP by-election successes or near misses, including at Govan in 1988. And the message was that Scotland needed active political representation and didn't seem to be getting it. Paradoxically, that made the much-vaunted realignment of the left in Scotland harder to achieve. Labour put itself behind electoral barricades, saw the elimination of its main rival, as the objective rather than the political and social progress which they shared. And that is an issue of importance because sometimes you can stand outside Scottish politics and look at many political hairs being split. I've explained how my own allegiance to the SNP came about because of a sense of social injustice. Now, on one level, that was driven and is driven by the sheer arrogance and wrongheadedness of those whose argument against self-determination of any sort from the 19th century on through two devolution campaigns to the present day discussion of independence was and is solely that Scots are incapable of governing themselves. And that remains an argument. Too we, too poor, too stupid, and therefore always going to be dependent. But more deeply, there is a dichotomy in Scotland between the public discourse about the priority of social justice and the actual actions that are delivered, particularly from Westminster. And that dichotomy existed and exists, not just in the way that the distance between political words and deeds can sometimes be too great, but in a fundamental way. There was, and sometimes still is, a clearly observable gulf between the social conditions of many Scots in housing, in health, and in education, and the rhetoric of a state which still believed in its own greatness. I believe it's impossible to support the expenditure of billions of weapons of, on, on billions on weapons of mass destruction in any moral society. But it's even more impossible to support the pretensions of world power that nuclear weapons have given to the UK when Scottish mortality rates remain stubbornly high, when unemployment and social hopelessness continue to shorten lives. The argument that this can only be changed by changing Britain, essentially by giving an English electorate the veto over Scottish priorities, goes to the nub of the question. If social change, if the answering of Jenkins' question, surely ordinary people must one day get their reward in a Scotland where honour and justice prevails. 
If the answer to that cannot be brought about by our own choice, but only by the choice of others, if we cannot do, but only be done to, then democracy has failed. In reality, then, when I talk about constitutional change, I talk about a means to an end. Uh, to be fair, I believe that Labour understands that too, but they haven't achieved it. And I believe the, the purpose of democracy and of Scottish democracy is to achieve those changes. This might be called a form of reimagining the state in a modest way, seeing the state as the primary, the primary role of the state of being instrumental in bringing about a, a long-term change in the social condition of populations. And it may be that in a discredited in places concept of nationalism, Scotland has brought forward a new meaning, a critique of society which connects accountability to action. It might be by those, why those who see Scottish nationalism in primarily historical terms, who, who make much of the referendum date of 2014 as a deliberate reference to the 700th anniversary of Bannockburn, or who seek symbolism in the 300 years of the Union, why they perhaps misunderstand what is being attempted here. Certainly there's culture, there's understanding of the past, there's creativity, but most importantly there is democracy and a desire for a fair, modern, democratic society. And 80% of Scots already vote for that, for either Labour or the SNP. And indeed, if you add in the, the vestiges of old-fashioned Scottish liberalism, then the total is even higher. So the core choice is a simple one, and it's this. Can the society that Scotland wants be achieved within the present constitutional setting, or can it only be achieved and sustained by choosing an independent Scotland, collaborating with its partners, inclusive in its approach, but socially just because it has chosen by itself to make that place for its citizens? Now, getting to the point where that offering can be made has been a difficult one, and it hasn't been straightforward. There's been a divergence of politics north and south of the border, and national solidarity has been buttressed by two world wars and the emergence of the welfare state, but then weakened by that divergence and also by the self-inflicted damage office, uh, often to key UK institutions. But there have been other factors as well. It's taken time to develop a credible, coherent, comprehensive vision of what an independent Scotland would look like, set within a European and global context, framed by a social democratic internal and external view. And that has only been crystallized when the party has come into government from 2007 onwards. The emergence of a campaigning, well-organized modern party capable of winning elections took 70 years. and It was the work eventually of the 90s and into the 20th century. The growth into competent government, proving the ability of Scots to make good decisions in difficult times has been the work since 2007. Now the task is to convert that competence in some things into competence in all things across the spectrum of government. And hand in hand with that goes the need to understand what our place in the world should and could be. That's been greatly helped by the academic community and indeed by the leadership of Tom Devine himself. He's helped us to see the indivisible link to where we stand on the globe and what role we've played there for good and ill, and there have been both. Now, actually, all Scottish political parties have wanted to do that, some even with the opposition of their counterparts at Westminster. That has been a process of national rediscovery, created by greater confidence, influenced by economic and political ambition, advantage, driven by long-term connections that have been re-established. And my personal story is perhaps to remain here too at the conclusion as well. I've mentioned passports and the role they played in my conception, but I'm one of three brothers. The other two live permanently outside Scotland. Most families have experience of emigration going back generations. But now it's not just a matter, perhaps not even a matter, of economic necessity or imposition, but of positive embrace of globalization. When my son talks about going to America to seek finance for his startup company, it's seen by him as a natural step in a wider world, not, though it's top part, it may still be, an indication of geographic economic disadvantage. But I think in other ways, my son wears his Scottishness more easily than I do. That is also a sign of a more comfortable set of times where who you are and not where you came from is the most important issue. And that's progress for Scotland as well. My grandfather never thought of himself as anything other than English, though he may have confused the term with the word British more than once. I suspect my mother, though she joined the SNP before she died, thought of herself as both of those things in Scottish too. There will be many, many such examples, different interpretations and self-descriptions. Polls tend to show that many Scots identify more closely with the description European 
than the description British, though they don't disown that. And they usually put their Scottish identity first. Most are part of that mongrel mix that I've referred to several times. All are part of the social union. Married as I am to someone from the island of North Uist in the Hebrides, I have added more diversity to the genetic mix. But I can sit on an SNP front bench, conscious that there are many around me with equally complex combinations within them, and some much more so. My dear and now departed friend Bashir Ahmed, the first Scots Asian to sit in the Scottish Parliament, was born in Amritsar a mere 21 years after Brigadier General Dyer ordered the massacre of 1,300 men, women and children in defence of the British Raj in that very same city. As a child, he was taken by his parents to Lahore, a victim of partition. Yet in 2007, he became a representative of the people of Glasgow in a parliament that had only existed for eight years, having been prorogued for the previous 292. That was also the social union in action, embracing, amongst others, Scots Asians and its breadth and resilience overshadowing and indeed all but eliminating the need for political union. People are stronger than treaties. And as Larkin observed in his poem, An Arundel Tomb, what will survive of us is love and its consequences, not enforced cohabitation. What survives of the political union, at, as times change, ambitions ripen and allegiances weaken, will be people and how they choose to live and work together. And people, in the end, cannot be frightened or bullied into staying where they don't wish to be. Whether we believe that full independence, independence within the European Union should be the national goal, whether we wish to stop for a while at a less productive constitutional watering point, I think all of us recognise that this country is not the place it was 40, 50, 60 years ago. It has diverged from our neighbours south of the border in cultural, economic and social ways that we had not anticipated, but which are a result of, as well as a driver of, political divergence based on the regrowth of a desire for increasing self-determination. Our traditional strengths of community and shared values have transmuted themselves into a worldview that's different from that of our neighbours, which sends us in a different direction. What will come from the divergence? Well, I think the evidence is clear. When such divergence takes place, when traditional self-knowledge is restored, when different values are seen to underpin national life and national direction, then the old structures can't stand. Scotland, being a country that moves slowly in constitutional terms, the exact timing of change is impossible to predict. Devolution took, one might argue, more than a century. But the likelihood of continued movement and completion of the Parliament's powers is, I think, undeniable. Offering the chance to choose is therefore the right thing to do. And the right time to choose it is when the debate has taken place within an informed electorate, which is comfortable and confident in its personal and social connections, but ambitious in its economic and political goals. As celebrations of this year's Jubilee come to a climax, it's interesting to reflect that in 1952, the Queen became head of a Commonwealth that had a mere seven members. Today, it is 54. The uh, number of independent nations has almost quadrupled from 1900 to the present day. There are few who would argue that Scotland couldn't join that number. The question is, should we? I'd suggest we're better prepared to do so than we've ever been and probably better than any nation has ever been. You as historians might provide us with some of the examples of how such change works, for good or ill. Or you might want to encourage us to behave as others behave and take responsibility for ourselves. But what you should remember above all is that this is a country of individuals who will make the choice for themselves. Each of them has their own story. Each will be influenced or persuaded by others like them. For cricket isn't divisive, Passports can lead to marriages, and the social union seems to produce year on year greater and greater diversity, as well as greater and greater ambition. We don't need to live together to work together. If we understand ourselves and where we've come from, we can develop a better way of moving ahead. It is in the end people that transform nations, not politicians, and I do believe a national transformation is already underway. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. That was an excellent lecture. Uh, we now have some time uh, for questions. Uh, when you're posing a question, uh, do state uh, your name, um, affiliation, and nationality. Please. Hello. Uh, Benjamin Grobe Fitzgibbon, uh, currently at the University of Arkansas. Uh, 
nationality, uh, English and British. Um, I have a, um, I suppose I'll stand so everyone can see me. Uh, fascinating lecture. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think it raises all sorts of questions. I'm going to limit myself to, to just one. Um, and if I may begin in the same way that you did with a, uh, a personal background, if you will. Um, I was born in Blackpool in England, but moved at a very early age to Northumberland, uh, south, of, south of the Scottish border, for those that, that don't know. Um, so our holidays were as often in Scotland as in England. Uh, Edinburgh was, of course, far more familiar to me than London. Um, I'm now an expatriate, uh, currently in the United States. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I've noticed as an expatriate is the, the commonality of Britons. I think in some ways I, I lose a lot from having gone, but in another way I see things that those are present in the UK perhaps don't. Um, and I'll give just, just one example of that. Um, last semester, for example, um, I had a student, a Scot, um, in my class. So on the second day of class came and placed a Cadbury's Crunchy Bar on the desk. Um, and this was recognition of our shared nationality. Now it transpired as we went through the semester that we were able to joke around and then equally rib each other about nationality. She's Scottish first, me English first, but both of us Britons. Um, and on this question of national identity um, and national self-determination, I think there's, there's two sides to this story. One, of course, is independence for Scotland, but the other way of describing that is the, the breakup, the inevitable breakup of the UK, if that were to take place. Um, and I was just wondering what you would say to somebody like me, um, who, who is a unionist, about how I would reconcile the loss of a, a British national identity and the country of the United Kingdom, which I consider my own, when I'm not actually able to have a, a say in that decision. Thank you. Well, I think I, can, I will make a rash prediction that the supply of country bars will be unchanged, north and south of the border, as a result of, of, of independence. I don't think that there are any people who, who should make this decision except the Scots. We have a, a, a right, those who live here, and that I don't apply any other def definition to Scots except those who live here. Uh, the normal thing is that they would make the decision on their own self-determination. There'd be no wider electorate. But they would need to make it on a variety of, of uh, uh, and I've tried to indicate that, for a variety of reasons, with a variety of questions. One of which would be the question of sentiment. I mean, I, you know, I, I think you are, you are indicating the question of sentiment as being an important one. And indeed, I, um, I was on the panel of any questions last year from uh, the north of Scotland, and a very interesting and I think very, very talented English MP expressed his opposition entirely on the issue of sentiment. Now, I think there are some things more important than sentiment uh, in terms of what Scotland needs to do now. Uh, I think that our, our, the nation of Scotland needs to play a more active role in the world. I think we need to look at where, as all nations need to do, where their adva our advantage lies. I need, we need to make that decision on the basis of what it will be good for us economically, uh, particularly, but well as politically and socially. And if we put sentiment into that balance, well, people will think about that. But I don't feel a great sentiment, but I don't feel a great division. You may have been born in Blackpool. I was born in Bromley. You know? So, I mean, I don't actually think that makes much difference nor do I feel any difficulty with seeing an arrangement within these islands that would, in a very old phrase that's used in national circles, uh, change the relationship from being that of a surly lodger to a good neighbour. And I think a neighbourliness based on equality would be a far better arrangement to have. Uh, I think if you live in Scotland for any period of time, and there are many uh, English members of the SNP, they came to come to realise that that relationship of equality does not exist and needs to exist in order to have uh, a, a prospering and prosperous country. Um, and that's what I think eventually people will decide on. But sentiment will enter into it. Uh, there is a, an argument that Scots will be deprived of watching EastEnders if the independence takes place. Some might argue a good thing, some might argue a bad thing, but that's argument. I don't think in the end those arguments are particularly important. Uh. Craig Gallagher, uh, Boston College. Uh, like yourself, I'm an expatriate, originally from uh, Greenock on the West Coast. Uh, thank you, Minister, for a very engaging talk. Um, I actually just wanted to make a point on that issue, which I found fascinating. Um, I often find that the same thing happens with someone from the Netherlands or Sweden mm -hmm. or Germany in the sense that we're more alike than the Yanks are to us. Um, Americans can be deceptive uh, in terms of how 
interact with us. But I feel like when I, when I live there, it amazes me the differences, the small things that you don't think would be much a big deal from watching mm -hmm. them on television. Um, of course, I love them. I should stress that, that most of you are Americans, and I, I love living there. <laughs> um, my question, Minister, related to your point about um, the teaching of Scottish history and Scottish culture, you probably are aware that there was an issue with the Conservative MP David Davis in Wales, where he uh, sort of ill judged the response, I think, to a woman talking about Welsh language teaching. Yeah. And it just got me thinking that obviously the teaching of Scottish history doesn't have the same linguistic discourse yeah. behind it. Obviously, the the social union very much encompasses a shared language. Mm -hmm. You're a Gaelic speaker too, so this, this is interesting to me to ask that. Um, do you think that, uh, I mean, per personally in my experience of studying Scottish history, there's varying themes within that. Issue of Highland history because of the Gaelic connotations and Lowland history and everything else. Um, I'm just curious how you get around the idea that um, people I assume accuse the Scottish government, and I, I've seen this, of imposing it. You, you alluded mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. um, I know myself, I think I learned about Wallace and the Jacobites in particular in, in high school, and then I didn't get the Covenanters and everything else to university. But how do you um, uh, yourself personally respond to the sort of suggestion that um, Scottish history mm. is kind of being deliberately uh, <coughs> emphasized because it hasn't been before? Where, where do you um, draw the line without necessarily feeling like you're deliberately talking against some sort of British triumphalist yeah. narrative? I, I think it's probably dangerous to quote Lenin at any time. But let's start with this. You know, the basis of, of, of uh, internationalism is nationalism. You, you have to know where you start from. You know, and we start from where we are. And therefore, it's quite important to understand what is around us. It's not an exclusive thing. It's not a, a thing that stops you learning. It's a way in which you start learning. And indeed, if you look at what we're trying to do in schools with curriculum for excellence, I promised Tom I wouldn't use those words tonight, and I've now used them. Those of you who, who, who aren't from Scotland don't know what we're trying to do in schools with this new curriculum. But if you look at that, that's about deep learning. Uh, and it's about connected learning. So what we need to do in Scotland is to make sure that that deep and connected learning embraces where people live, what they do, what their background is. Now, the issues of language are very different in these islands. I, I, Tim does me too much credit to tell me a fluent Gaelic speaker. I've, I've been a learner for 30 years. I'm a slow learner, but I'm eventually getting there. Uh, but I was, came to it through an interest in Scottish poetry. And, and you know, essentially, if you're going to look at even, and perhaps almost in, actually more than anything else, 20th century Scottish poetry, you're going to have to understand some Gaelic because, you know, the greatest writer of the 20th century in Scotland, I think without doubt, was Sorley MacLean, a you know, great European figure, and you need to understand where he came from and a number of others. So, but it's only part of who we are. If you look at the Welsh situation, it's a very different thing, 20, you know, the Welsh language has, I used to make television in Gaelic, the Welsh language television service had far more money, far more people, because it served a far bigger audience. There were 500,000 uh, speakers of Welsh in the country at that stage. There are more now. Uh, in Scotland, the number of Gaelic speakers is probably, well, it's difficult to know because the new census hasn't reported. I would hazard a guess it's around 50,000, perhaps slightly less. Uh, now, we're going to have to recreate the language and recreate the speakers in order to take the, the language forward. That's not true in Wales. But there are other issues here. You know, we're very lucky that we, are, we speak English with such fluency. Uh, T.S. Eliot believed that English was only spoken properly in two places. One was Edinburgh and the other one was Richmond, Virginia. I can't speak for Richmond, Virginia, but I think in Edinburgh we've got a moderate fluency you know, in the language. So we're very lucky with that. And that's also a great benefit in terms of the university sector. You know? Teaching in English is, is, is worth a great deal these days. So we recognize who we are. We need to learn who we are. We need to do some intensive work on that because we're not being very good at it but we need to have a wide world view as well and I, I wouldn't have an education system that divided those things out. <coughs> Hello, Martha Everson, Tech de Monterrey, that's in Mexico but actually a Dane of nationality. It seems it's all the expatriates here. Um, I have a question about how you will be defining who's a Scot for the purpose of the referendum. Mm -hmm. um, one of my cousins is married to a Scot and they started out living in London, and then they lived in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Now they actually do live in Scotland right now, but with so many social unions, yeah. how will you define it for the referendum? We have to define the franchise as those who live in Scotland, those who are entitled to vote in Scotland. There isn't any other way to do this. Uh, you know, if, th th there's some very extraordinary figures, uh, uh, and Tom will remind me if I get these wrong, but there, something like 40 million people worldwide claim Scottish uh, ancestry. And uh, actually, only two. Th I, uh, I am so glad that I represent him and not the other way around. Um, <laughs> a, but only about two thirds of those have Scottish 
uh, ancestry. You know, there, there are what you call aspirational Scots, many millions of those, people who want to be Scottish. So we, we can't do anything other. And I mean, that's a serious point. There are those people. I mean, they're, they're well documented. We can't do anything other than confine that franchise in Scotland to those who are living here at the time of the referendum <coughs> and are registered to vote here. Uh, and that's what we will do. And now there's a great deal of interest in that, and there has been a debate about it. There's been a, a number of motions in the Scottish Parliament about it because people want to count themselves into it. But the only way to do that is to live here. Uh, there is a parallel, and I, I suppose it's worth mentioning here, uh, in terms of access to higher education. We have a policy of no fees uh, for higher education for Scottish domiciled students. That means those who live here. Uh, you know, and it's a difficult thing, and there's been a lot of contention about it and a lot of criticism for charging those who <coughs> come from south of the border, but we're simply not funded to do anything other. You know, we have a rather unnatural financial settlement at the present moment. But we do recognize domicile as being the qualification, and that's what will happen in these circumstances. Now, that is also European Union domicile. I should just say you know, there would be no intention to widen that franchise because the European Union domicile franchise applies to uh, a variety of elections within this country. Just make a quick follow up. Um, how long do you need? I mean, now I'm just using my cousin's husband as an yes. example because he's a natural born Scot, so there's yeah. no question. And he's been living in Scotland now for several years. But say that he had still been living outside Scotland, when would he need to return his address? Well, he would have to be on the electoral having... register on the date of the referendum. Essentially, that Which is... Which means, what, one year before? No, no, year, no, no. You can, we have a rolling register, so you can get onto the register pretty quickly. You have to prove domicile, but providing you can prove you live in the country, you can get onto the register. I, I, would, I, I would have to go and look up the legislation, but I believe it's about a, a month you can get on the register, so it's not that complicated. Thank you. Thank you for that very passionate and, I thought, very moving talk that you gave. Um, my name's Kathleen Wilson. Um, my father claims... Uh, Scots heritage, um, and I teach in, in uh, New York at the uh, University of Stony Brook. My question, I mean, what I thought, I, I don't know if you were told yesterday of our, the, the round table about, you mm -hmm. know, uh, union or lack or, mm -hmm. break or Scottish independence, where people were basically saying, there were some very strong advocates for it, but the others were basically saying it's not going to happen. 60% of the people are mm -hmm. against it. And what I thought was refreshing about your talk was that you were suggesting that it's inevitable, that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It may not be in two years, but, you know, it's going to happen. So what's going to happen if in two years it's voted down? Oh, well, I don't do hypotheticals. No politician does hypotheticals. It's highly dangerous. Uh, but what well, I would say, I do think the tide runs in that direction. I'm not saying anything is inevitable. It will happen if people choose for it to happen. But if you look at the history of, of, of Scottish self-determination, look where we are now and look back you know, I mean, I would look back to when I was at Edinburgh University, between 70 and 74. It was a different political world. It was a different way in which that debate was taking place. You know, I have been a member of, of, the, of the Scottish National Party since February 1974, or the, just after February 74. It's almost unrecognisable where we are now. So I do think that that tide is running, but people will have to choose it and they'll have to be persuaded by it. But I'm not persuaded by arguments that say 60% of people are against it, therefore it won't happen, so let's not bother. You know, if we had that approach to democracy, we just wouldn't have elections. We'd, we'd simply have uh, syphologists who would tell us so-and-so people are against it, so we just won't have an election. You know, we have uh, elections, we have choice. There is a campaign to be had. The, one of the key points I hope I, I made was that that campaign needs to take place with an informed electorate we need to have a period of time in which people have access to the information. Now, we've said that the, the, the referendum should be in the, the autumn of 2014. That gives us a period of time for that to take place. I was a constitution minister for a period three years ago. We've been working very solidly on this. When I talk about well-prepared, I don't think anybody has ever been as well-prepared. But we need to put the arguments out there. We also need to have a genuine debate about the positives and negatives. And one of the difficulties I think we're in at the moment is that there's a great deal of assertion about the negatives. You know, this just will, won't happen, it wouldn't be good for you, You'd, all sorts of things would happen, but no detail. We need to have that detail about positive and negatives, and then assess what people want to do. I just, my follow-up would just be, is there a generational difference in support for independence? Do you think younger people are more apt to support it? Well, we believe in votes for 60 and 70 year olds. I don't think democracy is frozen. I think that democracy changes, the franchise changes. If you look, you know, the way in which that has happened, I think we are at a time where we should be enfranchising younger people. We have done so. We have very limited powers in terms of elections in our parliament. 
But in the elections we have control of, we have done so. Now, we are accused of encouraging that because we believe every 16 and 70-year-old will vote for independence. Actually, the evidence will tell you is that most 16 and 70-year-olds won't vote. You know, they won't vote for anything. Um, so I don't worry too much about that. But there is a sort of generational thing, though it's not so pronounced now. I would have said 10 years ago it was pretty strong. Now, the, most of the evidence would suggest that votes for, for independence are broadly spread across society and are not... Actually, uh, there's no particular demographic that's different from the overall demographic in Scotland. Minister, my name is George Christian from the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, just coming from the, America, the, the United States, it's so wonderful to hear a minister of education who's actually educated. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm extremely impressed and depressed at the same time. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question about trends in higher education, not so much on the uh, mm -hmm. referendum issue, but on your vision for higher education that you articulate here so well and so persuasively, of course, to, to us who are involved in this enterprise. That in the United States, there is a, a real counter campaign or a real counter revolution, I think, going on against the idea of higher education. And mm -hmm. partly, I think, we have an anti-intellectual tradition in the US that feeds this. But there seems to be a real political reaction against both educators and the purpose of higher education mm -hmm. to educate the citizen. There is no interest in educating the citizen <laughs> that I can see. And I really have fears for the development of higher education in the country, and I think this election mm. we're, we're having this year is going to be very decisive in that regard. What can you say about that? Do you see, in as part of your argument for Scottish independence, that you know your vision for higher education is an important part of that, and what's going on in the UK at large, which I think can share some affinities with the anti-higher education mm. movement in America, you know, it's one of those negatives about preserving the UK. I mean, how do you see these two issues coming together? Very fortuitously, education is an almost completely devolved uh, subject. In other words, uh, I, you know, the, the writ of, of Michael Gove in, in school education or David Willits in higher education does not run in Scotland. You know? um, a matter of some relief to many Scots, I have to say. Uh, you know, th th we have a default. There's the very tiny things. The uh, quality assurance for universities is still a UK activity. Uh, there is still, of course, an active role for the UK research councils, and indeed, you know, uh, uh, that's a welcome one in terms of how it operates in terms both of finance and peer review. Uh, but Almost everything else is, is, is our decisions. And we have taken a very clear decision on higher education and, and how we take it forward, which is entirely different from what is taking place south of the border uh, or, or what is taking place in America. We are, uh, I was at the, uh, Univer the Conference of European Higher Education Ministers a month ago in, in Bucharest, and they produce a map of Europe that shows where uh, higher education is either declining, uh, staying the same, or growing in terms of investment. There are only three little green dots on the map which shows growth. Uh, one was uh, Slovenia, one is uh, Luxembourg, and the third was Scotland. So we're unusual in Europe. We're investing more in higher education. But I think the answer, and we do that because higher education is a key product for us, essentially. You know, if you have five universities in the top 200 in the world, if you extrapolate Scotland from the UK in the Times Higher Rankings, uh, in the same way that Hong Kong is extrapolated from China, Scotland is the number one country in the world in higher education. You know, we have the best performing system. Now, I think that there are two reasons why, well, there are many reasons, but there are a number of reasons and two important ones why that is so. One is a national priority. You know, we see you know, higher education very important to us. We're a country that has the longest tradition of uh, compulsory schooling in the world. We had parish schools in the 16th century. So we see education important to us. But we also see, and this is, I think, the nub of your question, we see education as a communal good, not just as an individual good. And I think if you have a system that is based on an education as an individual good, then what you are saying is inevitable. Because it becomes a matter of one individual against another. It becomes a matter of those who can afford to do it and those who will get advantage over it. And I think, you know, and you yourselves know, I mean, you know, you're much better experts in it than I am, but you yourselves know there are voices in the United States who are saying this has driven higher education in an unacceptable fashion. It has driven research in a fashion that is only research, it's only teaching because it's funded in a certain way. 
you know, I, I have a very strong view, and Scott has a very strong view, that education is a communal good. And therefore, if we invest in education, particularly in higher education, we invest in society as a whole. Um, in addition, in Scotland, because of a series of historical accidents, uh, our, our business community has been pretty poor at investing in research and development. And that has fallen to the universities for a variety of reasons. So our research excellence is also bound up with our view of higher education, and that, is, that has helped us as well. So we have a distinctive sector, a, a, a successful sector, um, a sector which I think is regarded as a national priority, and a sector right across Scottish education which sees education as that communal good. Now, I think, you know, south of the border, I think what we are seeing is a, a tragedy unfolding because the, the, the opposite direction is being followed. I mean, at the Bucharest conference, uh, you know, the UK was very, very determined not to have a, 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 an outcome which praised public finance in, in, in higher education. Now, that has become ideological, you know, and I think that's deeply to be regretted. But I think the outcome of it will be an impoverishment of the system. I think it will be a separating of the system uh, into those who can afford and those who can't afford. And I think the outcomes and the consequences will be what we see in the United States. Now, there's excellence in the United States and tremendous activity, but it's not the system, in my view, that we need to have here. And I think we know that because we can see the, the benefits of the system here. But we can talk about that, I hope, over dinner because it's a very important subject. Can I use the chairman's privilege and... Okay, uh, and just add a couple of remarks, given it's part of my job. Um, yeah, you, should, you shouldn't be too gloomy. Um, I had the privilege uh, recently of, I was invited to uh, Columbia to listen to uh, Barack Obama deliver the commencement address uh, at Barnard College, and it was fabulous. He was in, you know, it was, and it had really strong elements of this very important communal vision. So you do have political leaders uh, in the United States who understand uh, about higher education and its value for, the, for a community at large. And your, and your current president is one of them. He, he spoke very well, so that's the first point. The second point is, um, if England was as successful as Scotland, it would have 500 universities in the world top 200. <laughs> uh, so, which, is a, which is a nice thing for us to, to, to say and think. And then thirdly, uh, we are very, very lucky uh, in, in um, Scotland that we have uh, a political leadership that do does have vision with regard to universities. And I was in uh, the meeting the university presidents in the League of European Research Universities in Barcelona, which met shortly after uh, Cabinet Secretary Russell uh, was with the other higher education ministers. And I was delighted because I had, through from that meeting, reflected from the leading European universities um, who had talked to their ministers, a really positive account of how Mike spoke. Okay. Yep. Go, you're allowed to talk now. Yep. I'm intrigued by the idea that Ed Miliband tells us we will no longer be British, and David Cameron has been saying much the same thing. Can we address the question of semantics? Mm -hmm. Given that Dumbarton means the fortification of the Britons, and the, the Welsh and the Scots are probably more British than the English. Um, how do we view that? And then if we have a United Kingdom that's breaking up, but we still have a single monarch, how, sh how do we define ourselves? We seem to be getting an awful lot of syllogisms from, uh, solecisms from uh, south of the border. Mm -hmm. I think we are still going to be British if we wish to call ourselves that, are we not? I, I try not to worry about that. Uh, you know, I don't wake up in the middle of the night saying, am I British or not? Um, I, 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 I think people worry about it too much. I mean, let's separate it out from the issue of the monarchy. The monarchy is a, a constitutional issue. Um, it's an issue uh, that other countries have solved very successfully by accepting that the monarch can be head of state in, in a whole number of nations. I see no reason why that shouldn't continue as long as the Scottish people wish it to continue, and that is, I think, you know, where we are. And I think they will wish it to continue for a length of time, and that's fine. I just don't want to get hung up on identity uh, and descriptions. I think the important things for me are what success we could make of this new venture and how we could move forward in politically, culturally, socially, the energy it would release, the potential it would release, the confidence it would give to people, and the responsibility it would take, and that is a key issue too. It has been too possible for too long in Scotland to be able to say, oh, well, it's not nothing to do with me. Yeah, Somebody else makes that decision. And that's a bad thing for people. It's like you know, the Scottish Parliament has very limited financial powers. That's a bad thing for a parliament. 
Politicians who don't have to take financial responsibility do not operate at their best. And you have to actually give them that financial responsibility. Uh, so I, I just want us to focus on the things that we need to do in order to make sure that this country is the country we want it to be, and to pay attention to a fairer and, and, and juster society and a better democracy. And I think those who want to hang labels and talk about who they are and what they feel and whether they are brythonic or not will be an issue for them. Uh, I, just, I just get on with it. Thank you very much. As a, a mongrel of Scottish, Irish, English and French descent, who comes from the Edinburgh of the South uh, in Dunedin, New Zealand. Uh -huh. uh, I just wanted to congratulate you for your fantastic talk and, and to make a quick comment and then a short question. Um, and, and, and someone who's worked on this New Zealand Scottish link for a long time had his first uh, sabbatical leave here at the University of Edinburgh in 1985. Uh, I think I can inject one note of confidence because I actually went on Radio Scotland then and said, you guys aren't nationalistic enough. This is a bit cheeky. I was a young academic then, you know. I was a bit, bit brash. And I went, I went on and, and I said this. And then, since you've got your own parliament, it seems to me that there's been this extraordinary renaissance in the writing of history and literature mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things. But, of course, that only came about because those things were happening anyway. So that when the opportunity was created, look how much more mm -hmm. has come through. And it seems to me... The fact that so much has happened since then means that even if you don't win the debate in 2014, and you may not, it may be a slightly longer, more organic process, is going to happen because the, the, there's something deeper. You're talking about this deep stream, and I think that it's, it's starting to come through. So, you know, good luck. Uh, and, and, you know, it's going to be watched with a lot of interest yeah. from a little country like my own that only has two universities in the top, uh, you know, 200, and one of them's mine. Okay, <laughs> so, um, and, and we're the only university, I, I think, uh, in New Zealand that has three chairs that relate to, to Scottish and Irish history and literature. So, you know, there's interesting things going on there. So we're very excited about what's happening here. But the, the question I had was, one of the... The big differences between your setup and ours now, and the most exciting thing happening at home, is the Green Party. Mm -hmm. Okay, they've now got 11% of the vote, they've got something like 17 out of 120 MPs. I just wondered, where does Green mm -hmm. fit in uh, with mm -hmm. the vision of, of a, a more independent Scotland? Um, well, we have Green, two Greens in the Scottish Parliament, um, uh, you know, uh, and there have been more. I mean, there were. The 2003 to 2007 Parliament, I think there were five Greens. I don't know because I made a little mistake of losing my seat in 2003 and didn't get back till 2007. So, but while I, while I was away, there were five, I think. Um, actually, Green, particularly climate change, is, is very much a mainstream issue within Scotland. We, have, um, we passed a climate change bill in 2009, 2010, I think, actually, which w still remains one of the most radical. Uh, we've taken it very seriously indeed. Now, it's... We've set ourselves pretty strong targets, particularly in renewables, uh, and our present First Minister is particularly focused on renewables and a huge enthusiast for renewables. So I think green issues are very strong with us. The Scottish Green Party has been and is very strong in, in, in trying to keep us honest, you know, and that is, a, that is a very important role. It is also a pro-independence party, interestingly enough. There are, um, there are three pro-independence parties in Scotland, two of which are in the Parliament. Scottish Socialist isn't. They were in the Parliament, but uh, have, uh, ha no longer have seats. And there's one independent in the Scottish Parliament who's a former nationalist who is, supports independence too. The three other parties, the, the UK parties, all oppose it. But the Greens are in favour of it, and I think uh, there, will, there will be a tension in it. Any government in, in the modern world uh, which is interested in and supportive on and, and motivated by, particularly the issues of climate change, has many difficulties to overcome because trying to balance between the imperatives that we see and the economic system as we have it and trying to change that is a difficult thing to do. I was an environment minister for two years. I'm very focused on those changes. They're hard to bring about. But it, they are mainstream issues, very much mainstream issues. Um, my name is Helena von Bismarck. I'm German, but also uh, consider myself a very convinced European. And I was wondering where you uh, see uh, Scotland's role in the European Union. Of course, that also depends on the referendum, and you don't yeah. deal in hypothetical uh, answers. But where do you want 
Scotland to stand in the European Union? Well, we, uh, Scotland would be, in, in our view, and pretty clearly in terms of the doctrine of successor states and other things, a continuing member of the European Union. There isn't a prospect of Scotland not being in and the rest of the UK being in. Either both parts would come out because they were no longer eligible, they'd both stay in. And the European Union is a very pragmatic organisation, a small country that had gone peacefully to independence and was positively pro-European. I don't think would have any difficulty in making sure that its membership was secure and taken forward, and that would be our position. Um, England would leave? No, I mean, it would be, well, I mean, I think it's more like they might vote to, but no, the, the argument has been, there has been a continued argument. Indeed, it was being, it was in the Scottish Parliament yesterday in First Minister's questions, the Labour leader raised this. There is an argument against independence which says if Scotland chooses to be independent, it will no longer be in the EU. So it would have to go through the whole accession process. That's simply not true. All the legal opinions shows that in actual fact, if, you, if a country splits, then both parts remain or both parts go. You can't actually do it any other way. And I suspect both parts will remain. And you will have a new member in, in, in terms of Scotland, but only a, 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 as part of that. Remember the difficulty when Greenland wanted to leave the EU? It was almost impossible to do because there was no, there was no means by which you could do it. And it took a great deal of effort. To, to allow that to happen. So I think you will see us in there as positive Europeans with some particular advantages. You know, even, even if there was a view, mainstream view within the European Union, there was a difficulty. You know, we would bring to the table uh, you know, a very substantial proportion of European renewable energy reserves, uh, quite a lot of oil that was still continuing, you know, a very good, strong export industry, and all the whiskey that exists in the world that's worth having. You know, those are... <laughs> Those are some arguments which is difficult to get, come at counter, you know. There's a strong pro-European streak in Scotland and continues to be. This will be the last question here. Then. It, it wasn't really a, a question as much as a comment on identity from an anthropological and personal point of view, Mike, but um, I'm one of those what would you say, aspirational Scots. I have a British and an American passport, but I am going to swap the British one for the Scottish one once that becomes available. But what I was going to say basically to the, in response to the young man from Arkansas, one of the key areas in anthropology in, uh, in, ver, um, in recent years has been the study of boundaries and identities. And it's very much a, a, a flexible thing in the modern world. People have these layers that they're negotiating all the time. And most of us do that pretty successfully. Um, and um, as somebody who lived in Japan for a lot of years and sort of came to identify myself as an Osaka person, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it doesn't seem strange that even with my accent, I now identify myself when I'm on the continent as Scottish uh, because uh, the, the average mm -hmm. person in Italy won't pick up the difference between my mm -hmm. accent and yours. So I, I, I just sort of agreeing with what you were saying earlier, I, I, I think there are fascinating questions, but I don't think that anybody will have such a difficulty in negotiating mm. that you know their heads will explode. They'll simply be, I'm a, mm. you know, I'm a Hib supporter and I'm a Lether yeah. and I'm a Scot yeah, yeah. or whatever. You know, we are not. We're all mongrels and we are all also chameleons. You know, so there's a great advantage. We can we can fit into that, but I I think we can make too much of it. Very often when you hear a political argument about something, it is because not just the person attacking has fears, but the person being attacked isn't secure in their position. And I don't think we should have any difficulty with the concept of Britishness. You can wear it lightly, you can wear it not at all, or you can wear it quite enthusiastically and still hold the view that for economic, social and cultural reasons, as well as political reasons, Scotland should take its next step. Very good. So it's now a great pleasure to propose a vote of thanks. And I think I'm going to pay... Mike, the greatest compliment, uh, and I hope you'll take it as a great compliment. Um, I, for me this evening, and I, I know Mike quite well, we're in different settings, sometimes we're nodding, sometimes one's nodding, the other's shaking their head, but we, we, see, we see each other in, in different settings. Um, tonight you sounded like a professor, and I was sitting there thinking, yes, you could have been a professor of history, a professor of literature, a professor of politics. I thought it was a, 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 one, a, really, a really wonderful account. Uh, very strong historical elements with, with, with very good arguments and particular points in time. I wasn't familiar with the history of the Secretary of State role, for example, like that. I found that fascinating. Very, um, a lot of political analysis, but with a small p. Not, not partisan, just you know, how the politics went, um, delivered in, in a very neutral tone. And 
something that um, the, the very best academics do, Tom, Tom Levine does it, which is a very strong personal element, because for these narratives to work and for them to engage people, you have to, in addition to this was the history and this is the politics, or, and this is actually true in, in, in computer science, uh, um, as well, but it's very true in history and it's very true in literature. There has to be some of the person in there. There has to be some of why it is, that, what the person feels about the subjects, how they relate to them, how it relates to their history. And we, we, got, we got all three, hi history, uh, politics and the personal, uh, but delivered in the most calm and erudite academic manner. So please, having... Uh, paid the highest compliment that it is possible for <laughs> the principal of a university to pay, uh, join me in applauding Mike for an absolutely magnificent keynote. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.